Well, thanks very much, Joel. That was a fantastic overview, really uh, concise and, and up to date and, and uh, very accessible to non-specialists in that area. So I'd, I'd encourage people to post questions um, in, in the chat function. I'll, Jill, if I can just ask you, and I know you get asked this question often, but in terms of the infection side effects uh, or complications of TNF blockers, um, what, what's your practical experience in our setting um, in terms of the risk to patients and what infections you see? Okay, so the commonest infections are the good old common and garden things. And in fact, pneumococcal pneumonia is the commonest of the, the severe infections. Um, TB is an issue, but I think we're very, very, very vigilant. Um, we've stopped even bothering to, try, well, we don't have mantus at the moment, but when they were, we weren't even bothering to do them because I think by our patients just coming into Curtis Cure, they've already declared themselves as high risk. So we're generally giving INH prophylaxis to everybody for that. Um, the, we've had some varicella zosters, um, which have been quite severe. And the one that we've seen um, was a Legionella, um, sorry, a Listeria um, a rhomboencephalitis, a very, very, very severe case where we actually gave a, a patient multiple cranial nerve palsy from which he still suffers. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really the, the worst of the infections that we've seen. But most of it's common in garden, nasopharyngitis, etc. Yeah. And And the... Um the used to kind of map, um, do, you, do you think there's been enough experience with it to really understand its full profile of risks and uh, particularly in settings like ours, could it, uh, given that it, it interferes with the IL-12 axis, uh, could, could it have, have infectious side effects? Or, Absolutely. So there's pretty good safety data. We've now got a long-term extension study, which goes up to five years, really showing absolutely no safety signals, no uh, cases of tuberculosis. And this was done in many countries around the world, which also had high-risk rates of tuberculosis. <clears throat> So I think it's got an excellent safety profile. Um, yes, I take your point that it hasn't been around as long as the anti-TNFs, but it has been approved in psoriasis for the last eight years, I believe. Mm -hmm. So there are large registries from psoriasis patients which confirm that it is an, it, it's an extremely safe drug. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's quite surprising because IL-12 is involved in the um, immune uh, access, you know, with respect to TB protection. So it's Absolutely. surprising, perhaps it's just not as potent uh, at inhibiting that. Yeah. Absolutely. So our next big group of drugs that are currently in phase three studies looking extremely promising um, actually are just targeting IL-23 because we now know that it's the IL-23 blocking that that is um, the effective mode of ustokinumab and that by blocking IL-12, that's potentially where you're going to run into any problems. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, either people can uh, type them in or... or um... Uh, post the, uh, or put up their hand, but if there are no other questions, I just wanted to ask Jill uh, one more, which is, um, I mean, just from the general physician's perspective, wh what are the common reasons that uh, your patients who are being followed up for IBD are, are admitted uh, to the general medical wards um, and, and what should we be looking out for, um, you know, if we're on an intake and, and the patients come in? Okay, so um, in other words, are you saying we're the general physicians that might be seeing IBD for the first time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, generally how they're going to present to general medicine is going to be with a dysenteric type of illness. That's the most common thing. And of course, commonest thing with a dysenteric type of illness is, is bacterial dysentery. But that is the typical sort of patient that might come under the general physician. And the keys there would be to ask things like, is there a positive family history of IBD? Have there been episodes in the past? Often you have to really uh, question patients very closely to see, and suddenly they remember, oh, actually, no, I did have a bit of bloody diarrhea two years ago, and they've kind of forgotten about it. You know, other things would be um, extraintestinal manifestations, which would suggest um, IBD. Um, and then, of course, if there's any concern about IBD, then they would need to have a, a workup um, with endoscopy um, and generally with IBD there will be features of chronicity on the biopsies which make it quite uh, easy to differentiate it from an, an acute um, infective uh, disease. In mm -hmm. terms of Crohn's, um, yeah, they would possibly come under general medicine because of differentiation between Crohn's and intestinal tuberculosis but I think it's more going to be the UCs that are going to actually present to general medicine with that type of dysenteric illness. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, I mean, in terms of the initial presentation of Crohn's, um, 
I mean, it, obviously abdominal pain is common, but can patients present with, with kind of minimal GIT symptoms and uh, kind of a more occult presentation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, they, you know, children can pre present just with, with a, um, short stature or pubertal delay. Um, and certainly, I mean, there's often quite a lag between um, symptom onset and the diagnosis of Crohn's. So it can be a difficult one to, to miss. And, you know, one of the classic ones uh, that we miss it is, is patients are labeled as having irritable bowel syndrome. But yes, you can have very subtle features to start off with. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And, and um, I just see somebody has, has posted in the chat function to ask the um, the rheumatologists about their experience with using eustachinima, but I don't know whether it has been used in in, uh, in South Africa yet uh, for that indication. Uh, Ayanda, I see you're on the Zoom. Is, is, is eustachinima used uh, for uh, psoriatic arthritis in South Africa? Ayanda? Uh, not... Uh, you're still muted if you are there. Uh, any, any other rheumatologists want to comment about that? No, it doesn't seem we've got any takers. Mark, do you want to, do you want to, Mark Blockman, do you want to say anything? Yeah, so thank you for my mediation in the, we don't, um, we've used it in psoriasis over here. We've had some patients on that and we've had quite a favorable response as second line. Um, I haven't had any requests from uh, rheumatology yet for it, but there is obviously patients with mixed patterns, which we've given it to in the, from dermatology. But in the private sector where I mediate, there's been a lot of use and a lot of success of, uh, of its use. And they're much, it's much easier to use than, um, than the TNF alpha agents in, uh, in, in that sector. It is, it's much easier for the patients and it's, it's, it's much easier from a prescribing point of view. And we have had some negotiations with the company around uh, access, and they've been quite favourable. So, and that's why dermatology has, has used it for re for rescue. So, uh, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that uh, when we have, I apologise, when we have our, um, we 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 considering looking at a, a bigger picture biological uh, medicine access within the Department of Medicine under the guidance of uh, Professor Tuzi, and uh, it, it got stymied a little bit by COVID where we're looking to increase our numbers um, or, and access, uh, look at what the most, uh, what, what, what should be utilized within our environment and they take that to the, to the EML. I know that uh, um, Bridget, one of her registrars has done an MMED, I haven't seen the, the results, looking at the, bio, the use of biologicals within our, within our system, uh, their use, what it's being used for and the adverse events. So it'd be, we're gonna use that obviously as well. And then with, uh, Biosimilars, hopefully that will be, uh, means that we can have more access within our own, because the issue is you may say, well, it's cheaper, so we'll reduce the budget. Now, that's not, not the idea. The idea is to actually increase and, and utilize it in, 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 more, in more patients with the advent of the biosimilars. So, so Jill, when, when you used to kind of map, is, if it was available, it, it really would be the, uh, the choice ahead of TNF blockers, if I understand correctly, because of it, it gives more durable um, remission and it's safer. Yeah, so it, de it depends on the type of condition. It's all very uh, dependent on, on the phenotype of the illness and whether we're looking at ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. So mm -hmm. infliximab remains the only biologic which has been assessed in a randomized placebo-controlled trial for fistulizing Crohn's disease. So it's, in my, my opinion, it's the only drug to be used in fistulizing. Mm -hmm. Similarly, it's the only one that's ever been tested in acute severe ulcerative colitis, the hospitalized yeah. patient. So those two um, indications, it's a no-brainer, it's infliximab all the way. Um, Eustachinimab would certainly be my first choice for a patient who has um, uh, Crohn's disease and psoriasis, um, which is not an uncommon overlap. Um, mm. And vedolizumab would be my first choice in uh, probably in somebody who's elderly, in somebody who's at risk of tuberculosis, in somebody who's had a previous malignancy, because it's gut specific, so one feels a little bit more comfortable uh, using it than, than any of the other ones, which have obviously a more systemic effect. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Joel, for that excellent overview. Really appreciate it. Um, so we're going to move on to our, our next talk, and our second speaker is, is Dave Epstein. Um, Dave is a, a gastroenterologist in practice at Vincent Bellotti Hospital. Um, he's also an honorary senior lecturer in the uh, 
Department of Medicine um, and is director of IBD Africa. Um, and that's really an organization that's um, interacted with the patient community um, to you know, uh, improve the uh, treatment literacy and knowledge of the disease um, and gain the insights of patients who've experienced the disease. Um, and Dave's going to tell us uh, the story of the journey of uh, forming this organization and, and what it's grown into. So over to you, Dave, and, and thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. Right. Thanks, Graham. Can you hear me? Yeah, hearing you fine. Good. Um, I just want to see, um, are my slides coming up? Can you see them? Yeah, they're just not in presenter view. Um, uh, uh, yeah, let me just change that. Um, uh, Bottom right hand corner there. Um, um, just hold on. Sorry, I'll just, leave just under the UCT logo. Uh, I'm not seeing it there. Just hold on. I just want to just. Um, Have your screen cut off. Eh? Let's, uh, hold on. Let me just start again. Uh, yeah, the option is to go to slideshow at the top. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'm just gonna do slideshow first, but I'm still getting that. Uh, um, not getting the presenter view here. Hold on. Display settings. Uh, do we know? Uh, so then presenter view. So. There. Okay. Better. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. You see that, right? Okay. So thanks, Graham, um, for inviting me to to talk on on this nonprofit organisation that I'm involved with, and I've decided to call it a journey from IBD clinician to to, to IBD activist. Um, so what is IBD Africa? So IBD Africa is a nonprofit company. Uh, it was officially launched uh, almost a year, just over a year ago. And we have a simple mandate to improve inflammatory bowel disease care in South Africa, as well as beyond our borders. And we achieve this through research, education, and advocacy. And we like to consider ourselves a home to all things IBD in South Africa. Now, I'm just briefly going to talk about autoimmune diseases um, because IBD is, is one of the autoimmune diseases and it's quite important to contextualize it. We know that um, the first autoimmune disease was hemolytic anemia described more than 100 years ago. And we now have more than 100 autoimmune diseases. And, you know, in combination, they, they um, uh, account for a huge um, disease burden. It's said that up to 23.5 million Americans have one or more autoimmune disease. And some of these are very common, such as hypothyroidism, but others are very rare. They share epidemiological, clinical, and therapeutic features. But particularly in inflammatory bowel disease, we have a number of clusters of immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. And I've just shown some pictures of IBD patients who've manifested many of these um, immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. So this you know, requires a lot of um, multidisciplinary work when you have patients with more than one disease. Just one more word on autoimmune disease, and that's really the story of Nut the polar bear. Now, now Nut the polar bear was born in captivity in the Berlin Zoo in 2007. And he was abandoned by his mother at birth and was in an incubator for some time before um, being put in his own enclosure. He was bottle fed with baby formula and then weaned to cat food and received some antibiotics at a young age. And then he died unexpectedly at the age of four from an encephalitis, which was, uh, was suspected to be viral in nature. But this article um, caught my attention a couple of years ago in the Cape Argus uh, weekend Argus, and said the riddle of Nutt's death finally solved. And, and he died from an auto immune encephalitis. And I think there's a message in the story of um, autoimmune diseases in the 21st century. All right, so my journey started in 2003 when I was very fortunate as a young and enthusiastic GI fellow to go to Amsterdam to take part in a, a fellows um, a refresher course. And um, during the, the tea break, one of the, the faculty came up to me and said, tell me about IBD in South Africa. How many patients do you have? Do you see black patients with IBD? How do you differentiate IBD from TB, et cetera? And, and you know, I think I spoke for the entire country when I said, I actually don't know. 
So when I returned to Cape Town, the first thing I did was look at our IBD database and we had a database of about 100 to 200 patients in the clinic. And I refined the database and um, in, tried to include all the patients that we had in the, in the clinic onto the database. And then we moved this on to private practice audits in the um, southern suburbs of Cape Town and from there onto a web-based registry and then encouraged patients to self-register. And we're currently busy with patient reported outcomes. And this certainly provided some answers to those questions questions, um, but also raised a, a number of new questions. So if we look at IBD in Cape Town over the last half a century, we can see that there's been a progressive increase in the number of new cases diagnosed every year. And this compares quite differently to the early epidemiological studies conducted in the GI clinic in the late 70s and early 80s, when very few patients were seen, mainly white and um, Jewish patients were represented quite um, prominently in these um, early epidemiological studies of IBD in Cape Town. Um, Jill mentioned the delay in diagnosis and you know from our data we've seen that it takes a Crohn's patient on average almost two and a half years from the first symptom to diagnosis and we know that delayed diagnosis is associated with complicated disease and higher rates of surgery. So where does South Africa fit in terms of global IBD epidemiology? So prior to the Industrial Revolution, um, IBD was a sporadic condition, but with the onset of Industrial Revolution, improved hygiene and um, uh, uh, Western living, so the, the numbers of IBD patients around the developed world increased. And in the 20th century, IBD epidemiology was largely governed by ethnicity and geography. If you were living in um, the Northern Hemisphere um, and you were white, there were, that's where we encountered IBD. But this has changed dramatically. And in the 21st century, we now see IBD as a global disease and is being recognized increasingly in developing countries. And what's interesting is that in these countries where IBD is seen for the first time, UC precedes Crohn's disease by, by 10 years. Now, if one looks at the different phases of IBD epidemiology, we see the emergence of the disease followed by an acceleration in incidence and then we get what's called compounding prevalence. And then one we anticipate by 2050, particularly in de developing countries, there's gonna be a flattening of the incidence. But if you look at the diagram on the left, what's important in the IBD incidence is that there's a true rise in incidence with um, modern living, but there's also an unmasking incidence. And this is where better access to technology such as colonoscopy and cross-sectional imaging unmasks a number of patients who were previously unrecognized. Another important factor in IBD epidemiology um, compared with other non-communicable diseases is that as the incidence increases, so we have this compounding prevalence, but people don't die from IBD. Much, you know, very different to other non-communicable diseases such as COPD or heart disease. So people live into old age with their IBD and there we get this compounding prevalence, seeing more and more elderly people um, living with, with IBD. So where are we in South Africa? I think we're probably in the acceleration compounding phase of IBD epidemiology from our data uh, would suggest this. And I think we can anticipate that we're gonna see many more patients with, with these diseases. We've done some research on our registry data, looking at various things such as TB and HIV, et cetera. But something that's fascinated me has been uh, the situation of IBD in Durban's Indian community. So from our registry data, we've seen a lot of white patients with IBD from Durban, but very, very few patients have made it onto our registry. When I looked at the data that's been published over the years, we can see that there's been a handful of patients um, from the Indian community described with IBD over, over the years. But if one looks at other um, communities, and I'm looking at the Canadian community, and this is work by Eric Benchamol, if you look um, at IBD incidents in immigrants to Canada, we can see that the incidence is very different in immigrants compared to um, Canadians who, who were born in Canadian, uh, people born in Canada. But within one generation, the incidence of IBD amongst the children of immigrants equals that, almost equals that of um, uh, uh, sort of native Canadians. So why in Durban, where we have a fourth, fifth generation Indian community, do we see so much, so little IBD compared to other Indian and Asian communities around the world? And I think this is a fascinating epidemiological question that, that needs to be answered. All right, after finishing at Critter Skew, I went into private practice and I encountered a whole lot of other challenges in terms of IBD care. 
So Jill spoke briefly about IBD biologics, and we know these drugs have been around for some time. The first monoclonal antibody was developed in the 70s. And then in 1979, this article appeared somewhere in the New York Times um, about commercial antibodies. And who would have known that this little article would herald a multi-billion dollar industry? The first licensed monoclonal was in um, 1986. And then Jill showed us the um, article by Van Dilleman, um, demonstrating um, a dramatic effect of Crohn's disease to a chimeric mouse human monoclonal um, antibody anti-TNF-alpha to anti-TNF-alpha. Um, we saw the first biosimilar to market in 2013, gut-specific biologics in 2018, and at present there are now um, six biologics on the South African market. But who has access to these drugs? So if we look in private practice, um, retail sales of anti-TNF units across all indications, there's been a steady increase in the use of these drugs. And you know, almost 40,000 units are sold um, in the country each year. But who has access? Well, you either have to be on one of the highest medical aid plans to afford these drugs, or be one of the lucky few within state services that gets access to these drugs. But the vast majority of people with IBD will have no access to, to this medication. And as Jill mentioned, it's not a panacea, but it's certainly an important part of our IBD armamentarium. So through our IBD Africa platform, um, we've tried to improve access to biological therapy. We've educated patients about these drugs. We've looked at healthcare legislation and making sure that funders comply with existing legislation. We've used things like ex gratia applications. In our practice, we have a vial sharing program to try and make drug go as far as possible. We have a big adalumumab donation program, which supports a number of patients um, with treatment. And then we use other sort of modalities where we can access uh, funding. And more recently, Jill and others have produced a very comprehensive IBD guideline, treatment guideline, which hopefully um, funders will align themselves with, this, um, with, with these guidelines and, and, and um, approve more treatment for, for the many deserving patients. Now, if one has an appeal with regards to treatment, one applies to the Council of Medical Schemes, and they will adjudicate that decision according to their guidelines. And this is the Medical Schemes Act of 1998, which gives us the treatment paradigm for Crohn's disease. And I mean, this is, is, is spam. It's salazapyrine surgery, prednisone, azathioprine, and methotrexate. And this is a completely useless document. It bears no resemblance to current treatment guidelines for IBD. And in fact, I'd say it's not a completely useless document. It might make good toilet paper. Right. Now, what about pediatric IBD? So if one looks at our data from our registry, we see that you know, IBD affects people in the prime of their lives. Most people are diagnosed in their 20s and 30s, but one in 10 patients will be diagnosed while still at school. Now, who cares for children with IBD? Well, we don't have many pediatric gastroenterologists in the country, and many adult gastroenterologists are not prepared to see children, and many pediatricians don't want to see anyone who's got inflammatory bowel disease. So who looks after these children, and many of them were finding themselves in, 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 in a no man's land in terms of their care. Now, pediatric IBD is a is, is difficult disease to manage. It's an aggressive disease. Um, distinguishing Crohn's from UC is almost impossible in children, and so treatments become difficult. We know that it affects growth. We use different therapies to adults, such as exclusive enteral nutrition and others, and one has to constitute a completely mul different multidisciplinary team if one's going to look at treating children. So we embarked on a program of looking after children in our practice, and we've tried to expand this onto the IBD Africa platform. And we started this with a meeting of children with Crohn's and colitis. And this, I can honestly say, was one of the most valuable meetings I've ever attended, where we sat and listened to children and their parents talking about life with IBD. And based on this, we decided that we had to do better. So our first step was to make contact with Professor Anne Griffiths at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Anne's a world authority on pediatric IBD. And she guided us with treatment management and we invited her in about 2016 to come to Cape Town to host the first South African pediatric IBD meeting. And since then, we've collaborated with Anne on a number of projects um, and meetings, and myself and others have attended her Center of Excellence program in Toronto. And most of this has been translated into our IBD Africa platform, where we have a, a section dedicated to children um, living 
uh, with, with IBD. Now, what about IBD nursing? And, you know, what I tell my patients is that IBD is a team sport. You can't do it alone. We require a number of specialists in various disciplines to help us manage people with IBD. But the IBD nurse specialist in particular plays a pivotal role in managing patients in a, an effective way. They help with patient education, with counseling. We use them with our children in school liaison meetings. Um, they are very important in disease monitoring, medication optimization. A lot of decisions can be made by nurses and they administer our intravenous medication. And I was very fortunate to um, have Corinne Davidson join our team in 2012. She's a professional nurse who did some training at St. Mark's in London in IBD uh, nursing care. And she has really led the charge in terms of IBD nursing and put it on the map in South Africa. And she trains and has regular nurse meetings and is busy developing IBD and, and nursing standards of care. Um, and, and this has made a huge difference to our, our, our work that we do. What about patient education and advocacy? So IBD is a complex disease and understanding the illness is an enormous task, particularly for patients. The treatments are becoming increasingly complex and treatment literacy um, is, is a huge part of, of getting patients on board when it comes to um, IBD therapy. What we often find is patients leave care when they're not involved in treatment decision making. And there certainly is scope for patients to be involved in treatment decision making. And this is something that we've tried to develop as much as we can through our IBD Africa platform. We've also tried to make patients aware of the multidisciplinary care that's required for, for IBD. And ultimately, we want patients to live successfully with IBD. So we started this program by holding IBD patient meetings at um, our SAGES Congresses every year. And our first meeting was in 2010. And what we would do is every time we held a SAGES Congress, we would advertise a patient meeting and get between 100 and 200 patients attending and would have mem uh, faculty members at the meeting um, speak to patients about all aspects of IBD care. However, COVID-19 changed that in that we were no longer able to hold um, physical meetings, but we shifted onto um, a Zoom platform through our Facebook page. And there was a huge need for IBD meetings during COVID-19. Many patients had a knee-jerk reaction that they wanted to stop the immune suppression with um, the risk of COVID on the horizon. And there was a huge battle to convince patients to stay on therapy using the latest data to support um, ongoing treatment in the face of this epidemic. And we are achieving numbers in these meetings far beyond our expectations that we had with physical meetings. And we get up to sort of 1,500 patients um, on these meetings, which has really changed the way we engage with our patients. And we'll never go back to, to physical meetings again. We then embarked on a program of patient advocacy and this we started and launched uh, on World IBD Day in May. And we started this with exploring the concept of patient narratives and uh, empowering patients through patient narrative and using this as a, um, to kickstart uh, patient advocacy. And we started with a, a fantastic meeting in May, which um, was, um, uh, we had great people on our faculty. And since then we have launched an, a patient advocacy training program in conjunction with Lauren Pretorius, who works for um, a cancer organization. And she's a phenomenal individual who's been very involved in patient advocacy. And I think what this has done is moved um, a lot of the work we do to the, to, to the patient's hands, um, empowering patients to challenge decisions regarding their care, to expect better IBD care. And it's only through getting patients as advocates will IBD care really um, take off in this country. And we see we're way behind um, organizations like Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America or um, um, U, uh, UK IBD organizations where, where patients are extremely powerful bodies, patient organizations and affect change in their IBD care. And so this is, we're in our infancy, but we certainly are moving along um, this, this path. Then lastly, IBD in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and this has been um, something that we've looked at uh, as part of our platform to expand the work that we're doing to, to, to people north of here who probably don't have access to great IBD care. So Jill and others have uh, looked at um, 
the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease in sub-Saharan Africa. And what we've done is, is collect all the case reports and small series to try and get a sense of how many patients are living with IBD um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's challenging. Um, there's a burden of infectious diseases um, in Africa which can complicate the diagnosis. Um, and treatment of IBD. And one also requires technology with good endoscopy and mucosal biopsies to make accurate diagnoses. And this isn't always available. And people have asked me, how many patients with IBD go undiagnosed in sub-Saharan Africa? And I, I can't tell you that. But this is an interesting article that was published on the prevalence of depression among patients in a primary health care center in Malawi. And in this study, 19.5% 5% of patients with depression were incorrectly treated for malaria. And this just gives you a sense of how infectious diseases in Africa can completely overwhelm and non-communicable diseases. So these are just some of the things we're trying to do to promote IBD in Africa. We run a, a spotlight on, on African IBD doctors, and I've just shown you two of our colleagues, Smita Devani, uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, who's a brilliant IBD specialist and does an amazing job uh, managing IBD, and Yao Awuku, who was a fellow from Ghana who trained in the GI clinic and is now um, one of our key um, IBD specialists um, uh, practicing in um, Cape Coast, Ghana. All right, so that's my journey, uh, starting with curiosity um, about a disease that I'm passionate about. Um, leading to collection of data, and this has really resulted in a 20-year in a journey uh, culminating in this uh, non-profit organization, IBD Africa. I think critical to this journey has been the concept of empathy, and with empathy, um, we mean understanding the patient's lived experience with IBD, and, and, and being a good listener is, I think, important to, uh, to, to being empathetic. And uh, I'll never forget Prof. Marx, one of the doyens of, of, of gastroenterology in South Africa, saying the technological wizardry has made the endoscope a virtual extension of the eye, but at the expense of the ear. And I try and keep that in mind when I, when I see patients. Mentorship has been uh, important. Anne Griffiths and many others, both overseas and local, have supported these projects and allowed this to come to fruition. Collaboration with a number of overseas organizations as well as local um, um, colleagues has been important. And then never forgetting humor as an important part of our work as, as, as doctors. And I think on that point, I'm going to show you a video clip from our RBD Africa website, um, which uh, um, I think would be a good point to end. So I'm going to just see if I can bring that up again. Um, if you could just give me a minute. And I just want to check that my sound is on. Um, let's just check. I'm just going to be sure. I hope this. Uh, where it says share screen participants, there should be something called remote control. Ah, oh, I don't. See you don't it. see it. Uh, okay. Uh, if I make you co-host. Uh, okay, if you do I... that, I can do it. Yes. Okay, I've made you co-host. Okay, there we go. Right. Um, Okay, let me see if I can do this here. I'm not seeing it. Let's see. Okay, let's just see. Control. Sorry, I'm going to try one more. Um, remote control. Okay, just hold on. Let's try again. I don't think it's going to work. All right. Well, maybe I can just ask, encourage everyone to just go and look at our, our website uh and look at our patient videos and uh yeah i think those would give you um a great idea of what it's like to to live with ibd i think i'll end at that point then
Okay, thanks, Dave. So just on, on that issue, we can certainly send out the link um, to the uh, the website and, and the videos uh, to everybody who's on the call. So thanks very much, Dave, for, for that great overview of, of your journey. Uh, and, and great to hear about the work that, that you and, and the organization and the colleagues that you work with have been doing. Um, I, I just, if I can ask the first question, Dave, I mean, clearly there's some lessons uh, here to be learned in terms of the management and engagement uh, with patients who suffer from other chronic diseases. And you've, you've alluded to some of those um, in, in your talk, but I mean, are there, what would you say, that, that, you know, the lessons that, that are more generic that you've learned in terms of, uh, you know, what, what, what role this has played in, in uh, improving patients, understanding their disease, their adherence to therapy, their ability to live with a chronic disease, uh, you know, outside of uh, IBD specifically? Uh, um, Graham, you know, I think it's a lot goes with, with um, looking at a, a community. When patients um, feel they're part of a community where there's uh, shared experiences, um, where there's ongoing meetings, education, updates, where patients feel that they are included in that journey that we travel as doctors. Um, we find that the, 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 um, the outcomes are just so much better. Um, you know, for an example, you know, we, we, we go to our congresses, we, we get all our latest updates, and then we share that amongst our colleagues. But patients are never included in, in those developments. What's new? What's happening? Um, how have things changed? What are the best practice from around the world? And I think it's when there's that divide between the clinicians and patients, um, patients are often left to their own devices. And until we cross that divide and say, you know, we're in this journey together. And I think that's in our IBD board, we have patients on that board. We have nurses, we have dietitians, we have all the people that constitute a multidisciplinary team um, on, on, those, uh, on that board. And I think that makes the big difference. I think, you know, so often patients spend um, a short period with their doctor, um, talk about their condition and they leave. 99% of their life is outside the doctor's room, living at home with their illness. Mm -hmm. and, and only a small percentage of time is actually with, with the doctor. So, mm -hmm. you know, we just see the tip of the iceberg in terms of patients' lived experience. And I think when we start sort of moving out of our offices and, and, and trying to engage patients on things that matter most to them, uh, then we start seeing shifts in, in care and better compliance. And for me, the most rewarding thing is a patient who comes in and knows about fecal calprotectin and knows about uh, anti-TNF trough levels and knows where their disease is and can tell me, I've got ulcerative colitis limited to the rectum and sigmoid. It's, it's rewarding to, to, to deal with patients who, who are knowledgeable and, and in control. And, and I think that's, you know, what we hope to achieve. And, uh, you know, in this process, we've looked at other diseases to say, is there a model we can follow? Is there a diabetes or is there a, you know, and, and it's amazing, particularly in South, South Africa, how few organizations are, are working in this space. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's the best way of answering that. Yeah, no, thanks. And, and Dave, just on, on the issue of adherence, uh, do, you, do you think that th those groups have, have helped uh, patients to support one another uh, in, in terms of adherence? Definitely. I, I think adherence, you know, as, as Jill said, um, you know, uh, our treatment used to be just for symptoms. And if you're just treating for symptoms, then many patients will stop treatment as soon as symptoms are better. Mm. Um, so, it, you, it, it, you know, when we, when we come to talking about treatment with patients, one has to sort of explain what your objectives are, that, that you know, it's not just symptom control. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I, what I always say to my patients is, you just want to feel better, whereas my target is different. I want healing of your gut. And those mm -hmm. are different objectives. And we try and explain how our objectives are different. is the patient experience and what happens to them when they fall through the cracks. Not just the adolescent uh, uh, patient, but uh, even uh, adult patients 
where it really takes time for them to come through. And even here, we sometimes struggle to differentiate, uh, particularly Crohn's disease uh, from tuberculosis. So it is a highly complex disease that requires uh, specialist uh, services. And I think um, the two presentations showed very nicely how that is. And I think uh, I need to congratulate David um, uh, for the work that he's doing. I mean, his database initially started uh, as a research tool to collect data and understand the epidemiology. But it has actually evolved into a tool that can be used to improve clinical practice and now uh, advocacy uh, for patients, which is important uh, for us. Uh, and I think he also quite shows quite nicely how it is possible for somebody uh, situated in private practice to continue academic activity and to collaborate uh, with, with, uh, with an academic uh, center like us. So um, I really appreciate you, David, uh, for all your efforts. Uh, and, uh, and I congratulate you for everything that you've done. And I, I'm just going to take this opportunity to say to the fellows and the registrars on the call that uh, I'm hoping that this uh, might sort of just give you some insight into what we do and that more of you would sign up to rotate uh, through GIT for three months. Because I think unless you really see um, these patients and, and understand how nuanced the, the management of IBD is, uh, you may miss it um, unless you see it. So yeah, I encourage you to, to please come through uh, and join us. Thanks. Right. Uh, uh, thanks, Mashika. Thanks for those concluding remarks and thanks for everybody uh, who, who, to everybody who joined us today and, and uh, a really great session. Thanks, Joel and, and Dad once again.